All right, I think we'll go ahead to get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I know the quarter just formally started today, so welcome to the first formal event of the quarter. Uh, right before we get started with Dr. Bankston, I want to remind everybody of an event we have coming up with Holly Mitchell, who's running for the LA County Supervisor. So she's running to be basically one of five people who will write legislation uh, and be a maker for the County of LA. We're having an event with her. Uh, you can Zoe have uh, diligently put this together. This is a big thing to have a candidate come and get to speak with us here. Uh, it is Monday, October 5th at 12.15 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we will be sending an email out with the flyer and everything, So, but it's Monday, October 5th, 12.15 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, it's also a Q&A, so it's an opportunity to come and meet and engage and ask questions to someone who's on your ballot if you're in a LA County resident come November 3rd. So definitely make sure you uh, come out and join us for that. Let the rest of the people in the waiting room in. There we go. Uh, and today we have Dr. Bankston, who was nice enough to take time out of her busy schedule to come and speak with us. Uh, Dr. Bankston is a scientist, an advocate, and a mentor at the intersection of research, higher education, science policy, and workforce development. Uh, she got her PhD in biochemistry, cell, and developmental biology from Emory. Uh, University in Atlanta, and her Bachelor's of Science in Biological Sciences from Clemson University. After her PhD, she was a Science Policy and Advocate Fellow, Advocacy Fellow at the Society for Neuroscience. Uh, she is currently, uh, for those of us in the UC system, is currently the Principal Legislative Anal Analyst for the University of California's Office of Federal Government Relations, uh, where she serves as an advocate for UC with Congress, the administration, and federal agencies. Uh, if that wasn't enough, she also serves as the co-director of the Policy Task Force at Future of Research, is the chief outreach officer at the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, and a biomedical workforce and policy research investigator at the STEM Advocacy Institute. Uh, she has years of science policy experience and expertise and is here to talk to us today about how to craft our science policy careers. Dr. Bankston. Great, thank you for that introduction. Um, happy to be here and it's nice to be speaking to one of the UC campuses as well. So today I'll be speaking to you from my um, role at UC as well as JSPG. So I'll be talking a little bit about that as well. Feel free to um, follow and share on Twitter. I've just put my Twitter handle here. It's just Adriana Bankston um, if you'd like to tweet any slides, feel free to do that. So before I start, I just have to say that um, even though we'll be talking about UC, what you'll see here is my personal views and not the views of the UC system. So what I thought I would do today is talk to you a little bit about my own career journey from the bench to policy and what I've learned from that, as well as give you some tips and tools for your own involvement in policy. So starting with, um, as Connor said, my academic training, I got my bachelor's from Clemson, biological sciences, and PhD from Emory in bio, uh, biochemistry cell, development of biology. So it was pretty much your typical academic set on an academic career path. Uh, I grew up with that. My parents are both PI, so I've been in the academic field my whole life um, and wanted to pursue that. Um, did a postdoc at UofL to sort of get, gain new skills and switch to a different area. And that's really where I started contemplating other options uh, in terms of careers. And again, not really knowing because having been used to being in the academic space and trying to figure out what other options might be out there. So starting from there, um, I actually, you know, my, my whole journey, I would say, started from this exploration of my own career journey and realizing that at UofL, um, there were not a lot of resources for postdocs. And so I actually started the craft seminar, which is career research advancement focused training. So it's basically a career seminar that brings speakers to talk to postdocs about different career options. Um, this was very helpful in terms of learning about what options were out there, also networking. And um, what I realized from this is that I was actually becoming more interested in the training aspect of 
how we're training postdocs and grad students for different careers, then I was actually interested in the research itself. So I decided to pursue this and try to figure out how to use this to build my career on this interest. Um, kind of broadly going out from this to organizing a research symposium regionally with other institutions with funding from the American Society for Cell Biology. And that really created a nice community around the research that I was working on with students connecting to each other and so on. And then at the same time, I was interested in trying to figure out sort of where postdocs fit in there, where I was fitting in, um, and what the institution could do to help us. And um, joined the postdoctoral studies committee. This was interesting. They had um, basically a mix of students, faculty, and administrators who were working on postdoc policies. And so I got to see how that's done and uh, how they think about that, which is interesting. And have stayed in this space of really being interested in university policy and how we might train early career researchers and what the policy landscape looks like um, sort of in the institution, but then also more broadly across the US. So then I sought to join organizations that were around this area. So I held some leadership positions in the um, National Postdoc Association and the Graduate Career Consortium. Both of these have a lot of university administrators that work on training postdocs and so really get to see how they think about this. And at the same time, this gave me sort of a broad overview of what they sort of what they think about training across institutions and it got me thinking more broadly about what does this look like on, an, on a, the national level. Um, so I was sort of on the fence between looking to potentially start working in a postdoc office and um, try to create programs for postdocs, but at the same time still thinking about how can I do this to impact more students and postdocs, not just that one institution. And so I sort of stumbled upon science policy and really not knowing what it was at the time. I got involved with the Kentucky Academy of Sciences, which is a good place to learn about policy education and advocacy related to issues in the state. Um, we also created an award for societal change for their members, which is pretty cool. Um, and this really started giving me a bit of an overview of what kind of impact I could have again beyond just one university and that policy might be a good way to pursue that. Um, here I'm just showing you a couple of talks that we had in the craft seminars. I figured that this is what you might be interested in, but um, Megan Mott was a AAAS fellow at the time. And the other talk that we had is by Yvette Seeger, who I'm sure you know from FASEB. Um, and you can check those out on the, on the website as well. So um, I think the best advice I can give you once and you'll sort of see how my story developed from here is to really find out what it is that you're passionate about and just just get involved in that. Um, at the point where you know I was starting out, uh, I really didn't know much about science policy, but I knew that I was interested in this interface between science and policy and scientific training and workforce development into uh, non-academic careers. So uh, this is one of the quotes that I really like from Chris Pickett um, from an article he published in ASBMB Today, which basically says, just commit to finding out what you're passionate about and do it by getting your hands dirty. So there's really no secret to getting into science policy is just by doing things and you'll sort of realize your path as you, as you progress. And this can be daunting. I realized that um, when you're going from bench research to pol the policy space, it can be potentially um, a space that you don't know what to expect. Maybe it's very broad. But um, if you just start, um, you will eventually grow your confidence in this space and be able to progress um, as you move forward. And as, you, as you've seen, and you'll see a lot of my path has been really driven just by my interest in this idea of training and, and sort of workforce development and what that looks like uh, in a, on a broad scale. So to continue with this, um, since I now was interested in 
um, looking more broadly at academic issues across institutions, what this looks like on the national level. When I um, finished my postdoc, I got involved with Future of Research, who you might have heard of. So this is a nonprofit that advocates for early career scientists, and we do it through the local meetings and symposia to hear from trainees and then sort of publish that data. Um, we also collect institutional data to try and increase transparency around academia with um, salaries or mentoring, etc. And then uh, try and push for policy change at the institutional level based on the publications that we have and the data that we collect. So this was just one of the papers I wanted to show you here. So in 2016, um, when I joined Future of Research, um, there was a federal labor law that mandated that postdoc salaries would increase across institutions in the US. And so we decided to do a study looking at whether institutions would comply with that law. And it became a really interesting study. It kind of put future of research on the map. Um, and it really gave me personally this connection between the federal policy and the academic world and how they were connected and working together and realizing again that policy might be a good way to actually impact this system. And this is one of the publications that we uh, published after, um, which is really fascinating. Um, this is essentially getting institutional data on postdoc salaries. And it shows that the amount that they're getting paid essentially varies depending on the title. So this is 11 different titles. And there are actually a total of 37 titles for postdocs across institutions in the US that we could find, which is fascinating and also difficult to track. Um, so then I sort of, you know, from this became interested in the sort of studying the postdoc population as a large a question of uh, more social science, I guess and that um, what postdocs were going through and uh, pay was a big part of that. But again, this is the connection between kind of the federal policy and the academic space. So just wanted to show you a few of our publications. So both of these were published uh, very recently in eLife. Uh, and both of them came from conferences that we organized and wrote up the data. Um, the one on the left is looking at recommendations for improving science training. So this is basically a mentoring conference. And the other one is more about leadership. So we surveyed um, scientific societies to, to see where um, <clears throat> early career researchers were in the leadership. And we're hoping to continue with this. But um, I think it's a good start to think about how we might empower them to um, change, make change in their institutions and um, use the data that we have. So um, at this point in my training. Um, as I said, I sort of was at the point where I was interested in this high level questions of how do we train early career researchers? Or what is the connection between the policy and the academic space? And really, you know, seeking to get involved in other groups that were kind of at this intersection, but more geared towards policy. Um, so one strategy was to get involved with groups that were already sort of in this space or I was already involved in in some way. So I mentioned that I was interested in the National Postdoc Association. I joined their advocacy committee, uh, was able to work with the writing team and lead that as well, which was great. Um, I presented a lot of my research at the American Society for Cell Biology meeting, where I was very, which was very relevant to my bench research. And then once I left academia, I switched to their public policy committee. So this is a good tip to um, look at societies that you might be part of that might have a policy arm. Um, that's a very good way to get started as well. Um, after my fellowship at SFN, which I'll tell you about later, um, I joined the local chapter of SFN, which is, has been a good experience to try and get, get some local policy experience. Um, at the same time, I sort of cultivated my national policy experience. So Future of Research was part of that, but it was really just the beginning and got involved more recently with the National Science Policy Network. And the last angle is 
this group called Women in Government Relations. So again, given I'm now in government relations, I'm trying to break into this space and learn about who the players are as well. Um, so I'm also involved with that group. Um, so this is just a uh, example here looking at the ASCB Public Policy Committee, which I'm just showing here because this is really instrumental in my training as well because I joined the committee when I really knew very little about policy and there were really great um, experts on there who knew how the budget works and how you would write statements from ASCB on different issues and really learn a lot of the basics just by, by volunteer with this committee. And this sort of leads into my next role with JSPG now. Um, so really now being very immersed in policy, but still keeping this connection between training and being interested in early career researchers. This is another great avenue. And so just wanna spend a few minutes talking to you about what JSPG is and what we do and how you can get involved. So you may have um, heard about JSPG before. It's an internationally recognized and open access publication, which is peer reviewed and is also a nonprofit. We are managed both by and for students, as well as policy fellows and early career scholars, we really try to cover all academic backgrounds. And in addition to publishing the research and policy work that they publish, we really want this to be a forum for debate and discourse for them to discuss the work in science and technology policy and trying to expand beyond the publications to um, have this, these conversations. And so our mission is to help both students and early career scholars from all academic backgrounds to bolster their research and writing credentials and policy and encourage them to contribute to the policymaking process at all levels of government, whether this is local, national, international, et cetera. And as I mentioned, be, uh, beyond the publication, so we do promote the published work um, on social media. So you can see our Twitter handle here, Cypol Journal. And um, we have a pretty extensive mailing list, which is international, as well as outreach that we perform um, on the issues and authors themselves, as well as other channels that um, I'll describe in a second. To get um, a sense of the types of things we publish, so we really try to cover every corner of science and technology policy. Um, here are a few of the formats that we publish in OPEDs, uh, policy memos, analyses, technology assessments, etc. So it's really a broad range of write-ups. Uh, in terms of length and the type of write-up, et cetera. And um, we also cover a very broad range of topics. So um, you can see here all the different things. Um, just to highlight a few things, um, artificial intelligence, the government university industry interface, STEM education and workforce, science communication, et cetera. And you can find these on our website and um, look some more. Um, in my role as Chief Outreach Officer, we've really tried to elevate the issues uh, and the authors, and so it's sort of a two-part um, strategy. One is to promote the issues, and then we have partners um, who are uh, involved in different issues, as well as the authors themselves and getting their voices out there uh, in science policy. So just to give sort of a flavor of this, um, you can see here the issue that we recently published with the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, this is a great collaboration um, focused on technology and um, how we can make technology more equitable and sustainable. Um, again, also within the United Nations goals. Um, and we um, have been doing several webinars as well. So here's one that we did recently uh, with the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships. Um, this was really helpful um, to showcase both current and former fellows who are also involved with this and have talked about how um, JSPG and SDPF both uh, helped them advance their um, science policy career. Um, we recently launched a podcast, which you can see here on the right, called Cypol Soundbites. Uh, again, the idea is going to be 
to interview authors from these issues and hear from them about their work and sort of broader implications of this work for the science policy field. So we just released the second episode last week. Um, I think this will be a great way to um, get their uh, work out there more and also learn how to run a podcast, which is a whole other issue. Um, we've recently started doing trainings as well. Um, so I spoke at the NSPN training on policy memo writing where um, the students also got to practice um, how, how to write memos in addition to listening to kind of basic lectures. Uh, I think it was a very helpful training. So hopefully more of this will happen in the future. And then we started in June um, collaborating on the certificate program with UC Irvine for science policy and advocacy for STEM scientists, which is largely for grad students and postdocs. Um, and it's open to um, students also from outside the UC system um, together with other partners. And this has been a really interesting uh, challenge to teach this virtual course and give them some basics in the field as well as ways to practice writing, elevator pitching, um, meeting with um, policy professionals and networking in breakout rooms and that sort of thing. So we're really trying to, to give as much value as we can through this virtual space as well. So now moving on a little bit further to um, how did I actually get to my current role? So all of the, the things that I mentioned up to now um, have been really helpful. I think they've all built on each other and sort of expanded my skill set, but um, I really hadn't done a per se job in the policy office. Um, so I lived in um, San Diego until about middle of 2018 and then decided that I really wanted to go into policy and apply to a lot of jobs and fellowships in DC um, and ended up doing this fellowship with SFM, um, which is in the advocacy and training department. Um, so that was actually a really good fit because kind of blended all of my interests together uh, in terms of policy advocacy and training. And I get to do all, all three things in six months. Um, and there's sort of six different areas to highlight here. And a lot of fellowships are similar. Um, so I think it's, it's helpful to know what the elements might be. Um, so their Capitol Hill Day is really their sort of major event in the spring. Um, the fellow um, takes part in planning and implementing the Hill Day. So we had about 80 meetings, I think. And it's really great to see how that looks and how that's being planned on the back end. We also represented SFN at coalition meetings, which is a whole other level of responsibility and um, really making you feel like you have ownership over your role and you're seeing where SFN fits in the, the policy space. There is also a research component to this. Um, so as part of this, we built a neuroscience champions checklist, which is representatives who have supported neuroscience research and funding in the past, or they might, or we, we want them to, to support it in the future. Um, keeping track of things that they had done, um, such as floor speeches, if they visited the lab of an SFM member who was working in neuroscience and other things. Um, and there's a lot of relationship building um, in terms of maintaining uh, connections with staffers on the Hill for issues that SFN advocates for and wants their support. And again, if they're new staffers and new representatives to kind of get them on board with SFN's mission. So this is a large part of um, what they do there in the department. So it's nice to see that. Um, I mentioned the training as well. So this is, I think, mostly by the virtue of the fact that, that this fellowship actually takes place in this department. So probably is not as typical but they have the Early Career Policy Ambassadors Program. Um, and this is, I think they select maybe 10 or 12 um, early career researchers every year to come to DC um, as part of Hill Day. And then they do some advocacy activity uh, go to their home state. Um, and it's, a, I believe it's a year or maybe 10 months program um, where they get get to um, participate in these activities and it's very selective. So that was pretty interesting, uh, getting to review those applications. They also do a lot of online classes. 
So I get to help with one of their mentoring courses that they are running online, as well as um, a lot of conversations around diversity. So they have this Latin American training program, um, which is also fascinating to look at how they think about diversity and training and publishing for um, individuals who are part of this program, which again is, is very selective. So it was fun to be able to dabble into the training side a little bit. And moving on to things that would be more traditionally considered policy, um, these three different things. So one is um, communication. So obviously communication is critical for policy making. Um, again, some of these things are specific to being at SFN and advocating on behalf of a society. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the big projects that I had was this congressional testimony, which is essentially what the SFN president would testify in Congress. Um, and they write these documents every year. Um, and this is one example here where Diane Lipscomb uh, essentially would testify and ask the National Science Foundation for a specific amount of funding to support neuroscience research. Um, it's a really interesting document because um, it really frames the, all the sort of, I guess, top three break, breakthroughs in neuroscience um, within the field, but also in the federal landscape. And so it's actually really hard to figure out what um, those three things should be and what she would actually agree to talk about and include in there. And this also is a good experience for um, getting an idea of how things work when you write something like this and sort of draft it, it goes to your boss and it goes to their boss and it eventually goes to Diane, it comes back to you. And so it's a little intimidating, but it's also um, very educational and seeing how the paperwork moves around and things are done to actually be able to publish this every March. Um, <clears throat> and um, the other um, common thing is responses to uh, RFIs. And so the NIH was looking for um, feedback on the BRAIN initiative, which is also pretty exciting to be working on. And um, SFN responded to that and different aspects of that. That was great uh, experience as well. They have an advocacy network newsletter, which is essentially um, putting some federal um, policy issues in there things that were happening at the federal level or the president would do things that sort of the community knows about, but also SFN specific activity. So if they had um, some members doing things that were interesting and noteworthy, noteworthy to include, um, we would write this newsletter every month. Uh, and this is something that's very common, um, learning how to summarize really large events and issues into maybe 200 words, that's a skill. So that was a good learning experience as well. Um, there were several events as well. Um, so hearings, markups, and briefings on neuroscience topics. That was really fascinating. That was the first time I had ever been on the Hill and experienced what it's like to be in those rooms and um, hear from really um, exciting, illustrious speakers. And um, also the first time that I read legislation related to the budget, so the president's budget, it comes out in the spring. Um, again, there's another project to um, look at how much of that would be appropriated to NIH or NSF and other agencies that would fund SFN and really learn how to read that kind of document as well, which I do now as well. So these are all very good uh, introductions to a lot of things that I'm doing now in my job. And um, the other side of um, the sort of the large focus of SFN is the annual meeting. So typically they have about 30,000 people at the meeting, uh, obviously not, not this time. Um, but um, given my scientific background, I was able to help with uh, researching speakers for different panels and animal research and um, thinking about how you might link representatives to research labs. And so there's a lot of effort again, on this relationship building to um, try and get local representatives to visit the labs of SFN members who work in the district um, or get them to come to the meeting and take a picture with a grad student who's talking about um, neuroscience research or that sort of thing. So this was interesting from the perspective of trying to think about connecting um, scientists who are SFN members to uh, representatives who are local. 
So a lot of different things. Uh, very fast paced and really loved everything about it. I uh, wish it was longer, but it was only six months. And so, uh, you know, had to find a job and all of that in the meantime. Um, so ended up um, <clears throat> in my current role at UC where um, really our main goal is to advocate for the system uh, with Congress, the administration and federal agencies. So it's quite a, a, a lot of directions here. Um, we do this by, or my specifically my role as a legislative analyst focuses on this, as well as advocating for broad policies that impact university research. And some of this um, are things like specific policy topics. So I'm showing here one, one of the projects that I had when I started was to develop a fact sheet on um, artificial intelligence research in the system. Um, which is sort of um, broadly why is AI research needed? What does that look like in all the campuses? And how would we actually advocate for this? And we actually held a briefing on the Hill with researchers from the system, which is great. Um, but just to show you about, this is something that I was not trained in, but being a scientist, you're able to research a topic like this. If your boss says, okay, now find out everything you can about AI research and what that looks like on the campus. And um, that's on our website. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we also, in addition to um, planning Capitol Hill visits and briefings like this for researchers in the campuses, we meet with program directors. So the outreach to federal agencies is meeting with them in relation to um, programs or grants that are coming out. They also have adv advisory committee meetings every year where they talk about for example, all the directorates of NSF and sort of their next five-year plan. Um, again, looking for new programs that they're developing or new grants. And then we sort of summarize some of that for the campus and send it back in the newsletter format um, saying, you know, this is what the new programs are. Be aware of this. And they, they get to hear from that um, within the week or so. Uh, and then we also get some questions from campuses specifically about um, research topics or events they want to do. Um, they've been doing um, hill visits specifically for their campus or specific centers, um, as well as funding questions. So there is, again, a bit of research involved here too, if there are things that um, we can help them with federally and things that um, are across the system, not campus specific necessarily. So there's a lot of different levels um, and it's an interesting role to be in, especially now with COVID and working for a university system. So um, that's really all sort of part one of uh, my path here. Happy to chat more, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of basics about how you might think about your career path and policy and how you might be able to make an impact just by a few basic things. So the first thing to keep in mind is that um, science and policy are really interconnected and they're sort of this bi-directional way to think about this in that, you know, there's two, two fundamental concepts in that Science for policies when scientific findings are used as the, as the basis of developing public policy and policy for science is government laws, regulation and policies that affect the practice of science. And I would say that most of what I do is probably science for policy, but um, they're really, you may actually end up doing both of these um, in your policy career. And they're, um, as I said, you can go back and forth. So I shared with you my story about government relations. So universities are really only one type of setting where you can do policy. Here are a bunch of others. Um, so I would say think tanks and universities are more classified to sort of a maybe research-based role. Um, so, or there's sort of a mix between you might be doing some research and some lobbying. Um, professional societies and nonprofits, as well as biotech companies, again, are able to lobby for their um, cause as well. Funding agencies, as well as um, federal and state governments. So again, keeping in mind that you might be doing policy either at the local level, or state level, or federal. That's, that will be different depending on where you are. Um, 
funding agencies, obviously NIH is not uh, able to lobby, but they're able to still respond to some of the things in the community. And so keeping that in mind and that you may or may not be doing lobbying depending on where you are. And obviously the last um, level here, if you are on Capitol Hill um, as a lobbyist, then that's what you would be doing sort of uh, most of your time. So there is a spectrum of the positions that are in policy um, kind of going from research to lobbying and in between that. And here are just a few of the titles, um, which I think are helpful um, when you think about or you see job descriptions of what these things are, and there may be other ones, but this is a good start. Um, so analysts are typically more on the research and reporting side. Um, if you want to be more um, out there and sort of communicating and promoting science, you might be looking at things like advocacy manager, public affairs, government relations is kind of both and lobbyist is where you really would spend most of your time on the hill. Um, there is also the programming side of things. So this is a lot of government jobs that are um, health program specialists or something like that. Um, government positions would really also fall under public service and a bit of a, a larger um, look at this as well as policy advisor. And so if you, you know, end up being policy advisor to the president or working at OSDP, that's a, that's a larger role as well. And then congressional committees, uh, which are harder to get into, but it's another level or another way to work in policy on the Hill. And uh, one thing to mention here is that, you know, people always ask about how can I develop my skills? What do I need to do to be successful in policy? Um, so the first thing to say is that you already have some of the skills that you need. And so just thinking about transferable skills that you have, you already are an expert in your subject, and that's very valuable when you're talking to policymakers. And remember that you are the expert, and you can bring that to them. You understand how the scientific process works, as well as you've done data analysis and critical thinking, and this is something you'll need, as well as project management. I would say most of what I do is project management is just a different type, but um, it's still the same idea of trying to manage projects and figure out what the priorities are and when you need to do them. Um, it will be probably more fast paced than the academic style you're used to, but um, it's still the same idea. And the things to develop um, would be obviously learning to communicate to non-scientists or things like, you know, what I mentioned, writing these things like a testimony um, is another way to think about this and looking at really broad ways of explaining science in a very large um, high level and not very specifically or with details as you might be used to. Um, audience analysis is important, so not all policy is the same and uh, the matters who you're talking to and what they might think about that issue. Um, consensus building, again, this is something that um, I think you would do on a regular basis and that if you're trying to craft a policy that you want several stakeholders to be a part of and sign that, um, there's going to be sort of back and forth in coming up with a consensus on that policy. And as you know, uh, networking skills and building professional relationships is really important. So a lot of the way policy works is sort of who you know and who knows you. Um, and um, a lot of you know, fellowships and sort of jobs and things um, happen that way in that if you kind of know the people ahead of time, you'll have a an advantage and um, this is also really helpful even once you are in policy and you want to move up or you want to move into another sector um, trying to keep these relationships because uh, they'll be helpful in the long run so you might want to you might ask yourself now so there's so much science policy out there and you know how do I actually find out about what is out there um, so I would say, that, you know, there's a lot, um, you have to pay attention to what's around you. A lot of this will be, uh, I would guess, virtually now, um, engaging in policy discussions as well as through the, through science policy discussion groups. And so that's helpful if you can get more deep in some policy areas. Um, I would recommend writing op-eds and blog posts, which really make you think about uh, to write to a non-scientific audience and I did a lot of blog post writing when I was um, in transition and that really gives you a good skill as well. Um, highly recommend using social media as well. So Twitter was very helpful for me when I was starting out. 
um, and really knowing who's who in policy or what they were working on and following them on Twitter and engaging in conversations. Um, that was a lot of times a very helpful beginning to a, a relationship with them, um, saying, you know, I saw your tweet or you responded to a tweet, uh, then you can um, sort of use that and say, you know, email them and say, can I set up an interview with you? Um, informational interviews are really helpful. Um, again, whether you're starting out or you are in policy, that's always good to know about um, what people do day to day to see if that's something you want. And again, building relationships is critical. If you want to get a little more involved, you can also call your representatives. Um, that's something that is very helpful for them to get to know what their constituents are thinking. And applying for science policy fellowships, and there are things you can do um, locally or nationally to kind of get ahead. But um, policy fellowships are a good way to get in, as you've seen, um, the SFN fellowship in my case. And I think you know, the last thing to say is that science policy is becoming a more popular field, I think. So to an extent, there are a lot of people in the field doing a lot of things that I told you today. Um, so you might wonder then, how do you stand, stand apart from them? Um, I think what I would say is the best thing you can do is find something that you're really passionate about and then talk about it. You know, write a blog post, tweet. Um, get on social media um, and find ways to gain experience. Um, so as I've shown you, my strategy has been sort of both local and national engagement at the same time in different groups. Um, and really just showing that you're excited and committed to this path um, that'll show will be important uh, when you're applying for jobs and fellowships and really just telling your own story and why you wanna do what you wanna do in policy um, can really help you stand out because there's a lot of noise out there and people pay attention to really genuine passionate stories about why people want to do policy and just let your yourself um, sort of shine through that and that you know I think that's been helpful for me because I sort of found this niche of um, somewhere in between academia and policy focusing on sort of training and professional development and the connection between early career researchers and policy, and I'm still in that, and I still do that in my job and on the side, and people know, know me for that. And so when they're interested in somebody that um, knows about those issues, they contact me and say, you know, can you talk about these things? So that, those are good ways to um, get yourself out there just by talking about things that you really care about. So before wrapping up, uh, just I'm going to leave you with a few resources. So I mentioned uh, there is this really good article from Yvette Seeger from Pipettes Science Policy. has a lot of good fundamentals as well as tips and ways to engage. Two articles here by Chris Pickens. So Chris Pickett, so I mentioned the commit article. There's another one about skills in science policy that he wrote when he was starting out. Um, that I recommend a lot for basics as well. Uh, I am showing a few scientific societies. Again, just to put the plug that um, engaging with scientific societies is really helpful. And a lot of them will have a sort of policy and advocacy arm to get involved in. I would encourage you to check out JSPG as well as the National Science Policy Network for opportunities. And then congress.gov is helpful um, for looking at bills and seeing what representatives are supporting um, and what issues they might be working on and uh, just keeping tabs on some of the federal policy. So that's really it. Uh, so I'll leave you with my contact information. Um, feel free to connect on LinkedIn and Twitter and happy to chat more about um, policy careers and uh, my path as well. Thanks. That was awesome, thank you so much. Do you have time for a few questions? Yes, that's fine. Cool, so we did. We had one submitted. I'll go ahead and read uh, first before we open it up to everybody here in the Zoom. Uh, the question reads, I am currently a postdoc in STEM, specifically astrophysics, and I'm interested in exploring a career in science policy. Are there ways to test the waters without having to undertake a full-time fellowship? I'm concerned that if I did the fellowship and I did not enjoy it, the time away from my field would make it very challenging to get back. Yes, that's a good question. Um, 
I think what I would recommend then and how I started was sort of writing if you if you have something that you're interested in um, pursuing in policy it's always helpful to write blog posts about it and sort of seeing what's out there on Twitter um, I think engaging locally is probably a safe way to um, if you have a science policy group or other ways to get in, involved locally is a good way to start um, I will say also that fellowships are not the only way to go so there are ways that you might actually be able to get enough experience to get a job. Um, and um, I think there are different routes, different ways to go into policy. Um, again, there's a lot of fellowships that will help you open the door, but it's not the only way to do it. Um, I think, uh, and as I mentioned, some of the sort of safe ways to do it are also engaging with your scientific society if there is a policy arm of that that's a good way to learn because as I said, for me, ASCB was a learning space of, you know, I volunteered on this committee and then learned a lot about policy that way. Um, so finding ways to learn about it without actually engaging in uh, the, the fellowship itself. Um, but again, the fellowship is not the only way to do it either. Uh, I have another question here. Um, so specifically about the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. Does the journal have a call for topics for policy memos, op-eds, the things you can write about? And if they do, how are those decided upon or do they just take whatever topic you're interested in? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I will say that most of that was decided before I came along. Um, so JSPG, I think has developed that list since about I think 2011 is when they started officially. Um, I think um, if there are topics that you're interested in, there definitely would, would be considered if they are sort of in that area. Um, I'm actually not involved in that side of things since I only do outreach, but um, I think that it would be probably open as long as it does fit in in this and as I, you know broadly speaking would um, really be acceptable given that we try to cover a lot of different areas in science and technology policy that if you come up with a topic that isn't there it would probably be okay uh, as long as it's within the, the realm of what we're um, focused on. I have a question. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bankton. That was great. Um, I was wondering if there's anything, kind of two alternate questions, if there's anything that you would have done differently in your kind of path or something that you learned later that you like wish you had learned earlier that would have helped you kind of make your career decisions earlier. Yeah, great question. Um, I think what, so what I would have done is probably start my career exploration sooner uh, because when I was, you know, my PhD was a great experience. I had a, a, you know, good female mentor and like she was a good role model and a lot of that drove, I think, my decision to, to think about academia because of her mentorship. Um, but I, it's nice to see that there's a lot more graduate students early on who are thinking about how to use their time um, in academia and expertise to transition. So that's one thing I would say is if you can start earlier than I did, <laughs> that would be good. Uh, at the same time, you know, it's interesting how things work out because if I hadn't been at, hadn't been at UofL, I probably wouldn't have done all this because the reason that I started is because um, they really didn't have resources for postdocs and my whole journey started from theirs because I there's a gap that I you know filled and developed something for myself to figure out how to transition and help others um, and that really drove my whole journey to again still keeping connected to the academic community and the training and the workforce development that I'm interested in and everything I'm doing now is still from that so it's that's an interesting lesson um, sorry what was the second question you pretty much answered it. I mean, if there was something that like you wish you did, too, but you, you did answer it. So thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Any other questions? So I've, I've had another one submitted to me here, um, specifically about the UC policy analysts. It's about whether you, the UC policy analysts approach legislators with a topic first, or if the legislators reach out to UC, how does that form of communication work? For the most part, we reach out to them. Um, so a lot of issues there will be, I think, different constituents and stakeholders who will sign on to something. Um, sometimes it'll be initiated by UC and we'll have other institutions come on board or we also work with the higher education associations like AU and APLU. And if there's something that affects the higher education community, then UC will sign on, AU might sign on. Um, and so that's sometimes really helpful when you're trying to advocate for something that you have sort of the whole community putting this ask forward and saying, here's what UC wants, here's what AAU wants, and it's all connected. And that there is power in that when you're going to Stafford and saying, here's what the community wants from you. And uh, it's not just one university that, that wants that. Um, I think it's sort of both. Uh, there is also the other side of, so I would say that it's maybe initiated by us, but at the same time, they're looking for the expertise that we have. And for my position specifically, I follow a lot of their research issues and uh, my background is actually helpful. So I'm actually the only person that has a science PhD in the office. And so they rely on that a lot when we go and um, advocate for issues in the system and that you're the scientist and you can, part of that is tr actually train the researchers to talk to um, staffers but also, um, you know, they'll ask us questions about what, do, what did we find out or what do we know about these issues from the community, right? So it's kind of both directions and that um, they're relying on our expertise, but then we also um, obviously go to them for what they're able to do from their position. Well, if nobody has uh, any other questions, I, selfless plug for the science policy group here at UCLA. Uh, a lot of the things Dr. Baxton has mentioned here are opportunities we have within our own group. Uh, we've submitted and had two policy memos accepted to the Journal Science Policy Governance. Uh, Zoe, who is our president, is a neurosociety fellow. Uh, we've, we sent people to the AAAS case fellowship uh, program seminar thing. It's probably not going to be in person this year, but you can do it from the comfort of your own living room. So the pile of these opportunities, especially if you just want to dip your toes in the water, uh, we have with the group just here on campus. So definitely reach out to us. Um, either me, Zoe, we have a, a science policy at UCLA uh, email you can contact us with, Twitter, any, any form. Yeah, and if there's no other questions, thank uh, Please join me in thanking Dr. Bankston for, for taking the time to speak with us today. It was extremely informative. Uh, and yeah, thanks everybody. Best of luck with the fall quarter. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or Twitter and uh, happy to chat more. Thanks again, Connor. Thank you so much, thanks, Dr. Bankston. That was great. Bye. Thank you guys for coming.